on World News Tonight. Declined again. Three days, 11 votes. Still no U.S. House Speaker in a paralysis of the U.S. government not seen since the pre-Civil War era. Was it a trap? A possible ceasefire was adamantly rejected by Ukrainian president, naming it as a cynical trap. Mass evictions. India's top court says demolition of over 4,000 homes in Haldwani. And it's a nighttime flare-up. Recreational activities at night booms yet again, recovering from the impact of the pandemic. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you're joining us on World News. Now the chaotic situation in the U.S. House is leading tonight on our bulletin as the House is adjourned for the third day without electing a new Speaker after Kevin McCarthy continued to suffer a string of defeats in multiple rounds of voting. As the fight for the gavel drags on, it has now become the longest Speaker contest in 164 years. Tonight, with a standoff turning to a stalemate, now possible signs of progress. Sources close to the negotiations say a promising deal is close in Republican Kevin McCarthy's quest to be speaker. Look, we're all working together to find a solution. But so far, the results have not changed. The Honorable Kevin McCarthy of the state of California has received 201. McCarthy has over 200 Republican votes, but 20 hard right holdouts are still blocking him from victory. This despite McCarthy overnight giving into new concessions the rebel Republicans demanded, including allowing only one member to call for a vote to remove the speaker and giving the conservative Freedom Caucus seats on the powerful rules committee, according to members involved in the negotiations. But the offer was not enough. And now some conservative critics are slamming the handful of McCarthy opponents. He has 203. Your side has 20. Why is it time for him to withdraw and not you when he has so many more votes? Well, Sean, he needs 218, and he does not have 218. We've been trying Neither to work do you. this out. But tonight, Colorado's Lauren Boebert telling her issue is McCarthy himself. Ryan Zinke of Montana still supports McCarthy. Coming now on to the ongoing war in Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a 36-hour ceasefire in Ukraine to allow soldiers to celebrate Orthodox Christmas, a step Ukraine had earlier dismissed as a cynical trap. Putin's Christmas truce, however, officially came into effect today despite Ukraine's rejection. In an unexpected move, Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered a 36-hour ceasefire on the Ukrainian front line to coincide with Orthodox Christmas, which begins today. He has asked Ukraine to reciprocate, saying it's an appeal from Russia's patriarch so soldiers and residents can attend services. But Kyiv has quickly rejected the request. President Vladimir Zelensky says the truce is an attempt to stop Ukraine's military advances. Now they want to use Christmas as a cover-up to stop the advance of our guys, he says. What will it give? Just another increase in the losses. Western allies have agreed. The president of the European Council called the announcement of unilateral ceasefire bogus and hypocritical. It comes as Germany and the US agree to send military vehicles to help Ukraine fight Russia, a day after France said it would send its own, in an attempt to create a breakthrough. The joint announcement marks a change in Western military support for Ukraine, which has repeatedly asked for up to 700 armoured vehicles to help force the Russians out. India's Supreme Court has put on hold the demolition of more than 4,000 homes that were allegedly encroaching on land belonging to the railways in Haldwani town in the northern state of Uttarakhand. More than 50,000 people, most of them Muslims, faced the demolition of their homes which allegedly encroached on railway land. India's Supreme Court stayed the order of local court to mass evict families residing on railway land in northern Haldwani city. The Uttarakhand High Court had reportedly given a notice to the residents and ordered to remove the encroachments from the railway area in the Banbulpura area of the district. Officials had alleged that the land occupied by around 50,000 people belonged to the Indian Railways. The advocate of the petitioner said that Supreme Court had told railways and the unions to keep a rehabilitation scheme in mind because if they are evicting so many people, then they cannot be made homeless. 
They have to be brought under some rehabilitation scheme only if it is proved that they have not occupied the land illegally. The top court also told railways and people residing that to not do any construction work until further notice. Protesters, including women and children, had been protesting for days condemning the High Court order. The protesters demanded a permanent solution to the issue. Meanwhile, State Chief Pushkar Singh Dami said that the government will take action as per the directions of the Supreme Court. The next date of the hearing is scheduled for 7th of February. Now, cartel reader Ovidio Guzman, son of drug kingpin El Chapo, was detained by the Mexican military in what they claim was a joint operation. Cartel gunmen are now taking control of the streets of Sinaloa just days before President Biden is set to visit the country. A wave of violence swept through Mexico's Culiacán city on Thursday as security forces clashed with gang gunmen after the arrest of Ovidio Guzmán, a key figure of the Sinaloa cartel and son of drug baron Joaquín El Chapo Guzmán. Witness video showed vehicles on fire and passengers on a commercial flight diving for cover as gunshots rang out at the city's international airport. Shots were fired as another plane flown by the Mexican Air Force taxied on the runway. Después de controlar... Defense Minister Luis Sandoval said Guzmán was transferred to Mexico City by plane. Authorities in Culiacán shut schools and told people to take shelter for fear of retaliatory gang violence after El Chapo's son was taken into custody for a second time. A video Guzmán emerged as a leader in the Sinaloa cartel, one of the world's foremost narcotics groups, after his father's arrest in 2016. He was briefly detained in 2019, but at the time hundreds of cartel henchmen overwhelmed security forces in pitched street battles in Culiacán. Months later, Mexico's president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, personally ordered Guzmán be released to avoid further bloodshed. The bungled arrest embarrassed the Mexican government and kindled criticism that López Obrador was soft on the cartels, which were producing large amounts of fentanyl responsible for a surge in overdose deaths in the United States. The U.S. government had sought the younger Guzmán's extradition for years, posting in 2021 a $5 million bounty for information leading to his arrest. His latest capture comes ahead of U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Mexico next week for a summit where security issues will be discussed. It isn't clear if a video will be extradited to the United States like his father, who was serving a life sentence at Colorado Supermax, the most secure U.S. federal prison. Along with the cartel crisis, Mexico has more updates. The U.S. president is hoping to announce new plans on the border situation in Mexico as he plans to visit the border for the first time as president. Joe Biden said that the United States will expand Trump-era restrictions to rapidly expel Cuban, Nicaraguan and Haitian migrants caught illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. If you're trying to leave Cuba, Nicaragua or Haiti, you have, and we, or have agreed to begin a journey to America, do not, do not just show up at the border. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday laid out a plan to deter record numbers of migrants from making a dangerous journey and attempting to cross into the United States from Mexico. And that plan involves using Trump-era restrictions to rapidly expel Cuban, Nicaraguan and Haitian migrants caught illegally crossing the border while at the same time allowing up to 30,000 eligible people from those countries, plus Venezuela, to enter the U.S. by air each month. This new process is orderly, it's safe, and it's humane. The new process is designed to blunt criticism from Republicans who say Biden has not done enough to control surging immigration attempts. Government data shows that in November alone, border guards encountered 82,000 migrants from Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela who were attempting to enter without permission. A flea oppression. Biden's new plan is also meant to address the concerns of Democrats and immigration advocates who say Title 42 restrictions adopted under former President Donald Trump block migrants from exercising their right to apply for asylum and expose them to danger. Title 42 or not, the border is not open. Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas detailed the new policy on Thursday, elaborating on Title 42 and Title 8, which allows border agents to rapidly send migrants back to Mexico or other countries. Individuals who cannot establish a valid claim to protection 
under the standards set out in the new rule will be subject to prompt removal under Title VIII authorities, which carries a five-year ban on reentry. Mexico will accept up to 30,000 expelled migrants per month from the four countries outlined in Biden's plan. And the story of America is the story of so many of your families. Biden, who defended the role immigrants play in the country, said he will visit El Paso, Texas on Sunday for his first trip to the U.S.-Mexico border since taking office. In El Paso, Biden plans to speak to officials who have struggled in recent months to deal with tens of thousands of migrants. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The tension in the Pacific is rising. As lawmakers in South Korea were briefed about the latest intelligence on North Korea, the National Intelligence Service is said to have reiterated in the briefing that the regime has finished preparations for its next nuclear test and also confirmed that the North's former foreign minister, Ri Yong-ho, was indeed purged. South Korea's National Intelligence Service has told lawmakers that the roads leading to North Korea's Yongbyon nuclear complex have been completed, meaning the regime's next nuclear test, which would be its seventh overall and first since 2017, could take place at any time. That's according to South Korean lawmaker Yoo sang Bom of the ruling People Power Party. Speaking at a briefing after a session of the National Assembly's Intelligence Committee, as for the regime's missiles, he said officials from the National Intelligence Service reported in the session that it's not yet clear whether Pyongyang's so-called high-thrust solid-fuel motor that it tested last month could actually produce what it claimed to be a thrust of 140 tons. The NIS believes the engine is of an ICBM grade, but is not yet certain whether it could actually provide such a strong thrust although it looks possible judging from what the engine looks like on the outside. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party of Korea's Yoon Gon-young told reporters that the intelligence authorities aren't sure whether the North's former foreign minister, Lee Yong ho was executed last year, as was reported on Wednesday by the Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shimbun. The NIS confirmed that Lee Yong ho was purged, but said it couldn't be verified whether he was executed. The latest intelligence comes after a year of unprecedented military provocations from the North, prompting observations from experts that inter-Korean relations will likely not improve in the first half of 2023. COVID-19 hospitalizations in China have jumped nearly 50% over the past week, and experts say that 1 million deaths are quite possible. With that, European countries are also imposing travel measures on visitors from China. According to the World Health Organization on Thursday, COVID-19 hospitalization figures have soared nearly 50% over the past week. The date on the weekly status of COVID-19 in China, released by the WHO, shows that the number of new COVID-19 hospitalization in China increased by 46 percent on week. Chinese authorities also say 218,019 new cases of COVID-19 and 648 deaths were reported this week. However, the WHO says it's unclear if the data supplied by China is accurate and that the situation could be even worse. Airfinity, a British medical data analysis company, estimates 2 million COVID-19 cases per day in China and around 10,000 deaths. Despite this, China reaffirmed its stance that it has been transparent with its data. Facts have proven that China has always maintained close communication with the World Health Organization and shared relevant information and data in a timely manner in accordance with the principles of law, timeliness, openness and transparency. In response to growing calls from the EU to its member states to impose stricter travel measures for travelers from China, Germany, Belgium and Sweden are set to mandate COVID-19 testing before entry to their countries. Germany had previously been against such measures on the grounds that a new mutant virus had not yet emerged in China, but sharply changed its stance after the EU recommendation. 
Heading back, the Chinese Foreign Ministry says COVID-19 measures should be based on science and facts and that there should be no attempts to politicize the issue or adopt a discriminatory practice that affects regular person-to-person -person exchanges. Now, the microblogging giant Twitter experiences another data breach. Data alleged to contain the email addresses of more than 200 million Twitter users is being given away for free on a hacker forum. A security researcher has said hackers stole the email addresses of more than 200 million Twitter users and posted them on a hacking forum. Alan Gall, co-founder of Israeli cybersecurity monitoring firm Hudson Rock, mentioned that the breach will unfortunately lead to a lot of hacking, targeting phishing and doxing. He called it, quote, one of the most significant leaks I've ever seen. The stolen information includes email addresses used to set up accounts which will worry anonymous users who registered with a sensitive address. Twitter has not commented on the report, with Gulf first posted about on social media in December, nor responded to inquiries about the breach since that date. It was not clear what action, if any, Twitter has taken to investigate or remediate the issue. Troy Hunt, creator of Breach Notification site, Have I Been Pooned, viewed the leaked data and said on Twitter that it seemed pretty much what it's been described as. There were no clues to the identity of the location of the hacker or hackers behind the breach. It may have taken place as early as 2021 before Elon Musk took ownership of the company last year. Claims about the size and scope of the breach initially varied with early accounts in December, which said 400 million email addresses and phone numbers were stolen. A serious breach at Twitter may interest regulators on both sides of the Atlantic. The Data Protection Commission in Ireland, where Twitter has its European headquarters and the United States Federal Trade Commission, have been monitoring the Musk-owned company for compliance with European data protection rules and a U.S. consent order respectively. In recent weeks, there has been concern about whether Kenya is the next Ghana after the latter defaulted on its debt repayment obligations. On that, Kenya's President William Ruto confirms his government will ramp up tax collection and cut borrowing as he vowed that the African country will not default on its debt. Kenya will not default on its debt, its president has promised. In a wide-ranging interview with Kenyan media outlets on Wednesday, William Ruto also said the government plans to ramp up tax collection over the next two years. The East African country saw public debt surge during an infrastructure construction drive, including for roads and rail, under Ruto's predecessor, Uhuru Kenyatta. Last year, ratings agency Fitch warned that government debt levels and global interest rates were increasing the threat of credit rating downgrades in as many as 10 African countries. Kenya was identified as one of those most at risk. Since Russo's government took over in September, it has pledged to curb expensive commercial borrowing in favour of cheaper sources like the World Bank. We have applied the brakes on more borrowing, Ruto said on Wednesday. He added that the government aimed to collect an extra 1 trillion shillings, or 8.1 billion US dollars, in taxes over the next two years. The president also reiterated plans to cut 300 billion shillings, that's approaching 2.5 billion US dollars, in borrowing in the current fiscal year that runs until the end of June. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Kilauea volcano in Hawaii began erupting. The U.S. Geological Service's volcanic activity notice said after detecting a glow in the summit producing smog that is confined within the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. A massive Pacific storm unleashed high winds, torrential rains and heavy snows across California for a second day, knocking out power tens of thousands of homes and disrupting road travel with widespread flooding. CES, the annual technology industry show in Las Vegas, opened its doors to the public. The annual consumer electronics show draws thousands of technology enthusiasts to Las Vegas for a peek at the latest innovations. Samsung Electronics reported a likely 69% plunge in Q4 operating profit to an 8-year low as a global economic downturn saps demand for electronic devices and clouds the memory chip industry outlook. Streets near Maracana Stadium was named after the soccer star Pele. A sign outside the stadium paying tribute to the late great has become a new point of interest for local and international visitors.
And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now, Urumqi is seeing a recovering nighttime economy from the impact of the epidemic. We leave you tonight with residents and tourists enjoying themselves in places featuring recreational activities at night. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.